Hi there. Welcome to the Whispering Gallery. I'm Suzanne Nicolaisen, and I'm glad you're joining me for the Ghosts of Legendary Labyrinths. We're going to talk about the Ghosts of Labyrinths Past. This is part one in a two-part series. We're going to be talking in this episode about the Greek legend of the Minotaur and the King of Crete, King Minos. What would the ruins of the Palace of Ignasos look like in the moonlight? An uneven grid of box-like rooms, interrupted by darker, larger forms, like a midnight quilt unfolding into the night. A cascade of history fading into silhouette, shadow, and interpretation. The Palace of Nassos was built on the largest island in Greece, that's Crete. The island has mountains, gorges, and appears to be a bit of a desert, but the water surrounding the island is brilliant thalo and cerulean blue. The island of Crete is the southernmost point of Europe, where the summertime temperatures can reach up to 90 degrees, and during the winter it can get as low as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Their closest neighbors? Italy, Libya, Egypt, and Turkey. The island is between the Sea of Crete and the Mediterranean Sea, and the water is well zoologist Gary Meany posted in Quora. While the famously blue and clear waters of the Mediterranean may be attractive, they're not exactly a good thing. Ecologically speaking, in abundance, phytoplankton which form the base of the food chain in the oceans, can stain the surrounding water green. I found that answer in another place, while some other people posted about the blue sky having something to do with it. Either way, the water seems to be very clear and very blue. So let's try this again, so we can actually get started. What would the ruins of the Palace of Nassos look like in the moonlight? monotone midnight hues, softly illuminating the stones along the royal road to the palace. A breeze sent by the starry night stirring the dark forms of cypress trees. At the palace, silhouettes of pillars, dark shapes of rooms, rocks and ruins unfold. Clouds whispering across the sky cause shadows to shift in their hiding places. Frescoes, like the bull dancers, have been turned into shadowy shapes and the hidden secrets of the mysterious alabaster throne room are shrouded in the deep night. So what about the ghosts in the depths of the legendary labyrinth, in the deep dark below the palace, the place where Theseus and the Minotaur had their showdown? Where does myth end and reality meet? Was there really a labyrinth? I would really hate to be alone in the dark during our story about a monster, scapegoat, villain, perhaps victim, and his home in a legendary labyrinth. Why isn't he out grazing in a grassy field? Maybe he was when nobody was looking. Get a call on the old seashell horn from Dad when he was needed in the labyrinth. Today we're heading to Greece, known as the cradle of Western civilization and home to excellent pastries like baklava, thin layers of phyllo dough, nuts and honey cut into diamond shapes. Korobiades is a butter and almond cookie coated in powdered sugar, and then there's dipples. We had a nice neighbor, a Greek woman, Katina. She lived across the street when I was a kid, and she would bring our family plates of pastries during the holidays. 
This is why I have had dipples. This is a thin dough that is rolled and fried, dipped in honey, and sprinkled with cinnamon and or nuts. The pastry is a light, crunchy swirl of goodness. You can break pieces off and repeat, but you end up sticky, and it's a fair enough trade. As long as we're talking about honey, did you know that the bees were said to be the messengers of the gods? I know, we're not here for the pastries, as good as they are. There's a story. Okay, as usual, there's a couple of stories. And a labyrinth underneath a Greek palace. So, me and my definitions. What's the difference between a castle and a palace? So the castles have turrets and a moat. A palace is more sprawling and lower to the ground. So the prose tell us from Oxford languages. It's a noun. A large building, typically of the medieval period, fortified against attack with thick walls, battlements, towers, and in many cases a moat, as in Edinburgh Castle. Okay, so that's a castle, fortified. So Wikipedia defines palace as, a palace is a grand residence, especially a royal residence, or the home of a head of state or some other high-ranking dignitary, such as a bishop or archbishop. The word is derived from the Latin name palatium for Palatine Hill in Rome, which housed the imperial residences. They continue, a palace is distinguished from a castle while the latter clearly is fortified or has the style of a fortification, whereas a palace does not. So I guess you don't want to live where you're going to be having a battle all of the time. You want something with a patio, perhaps, and a view. Sir Arthur Evans didn't consider it a big stretch of the imagination to consider the Palace Nassos possible proof of the legendary labyrinth. So who was he? He was an archaeologist who put together some of the ruins, again, some said, with a little too much imagination. What's the difference between a labyrinth and a maze or even a hedge maze? A hedge maze would take the garden design to a new level of complicated. How would you water that? Drip line or rain birds? English Heritage states, quote, The difference between mazes and labyrinths is that labyrinths have a single continuous path which leads to the center. As long as you keep going forward, you will get there eventually. Mazes have multiple paths which branch off and will not necessarily lead to the center. The Minotaur was a powerful creature from the stories of Greek mythology, a bull-headed and bull-swishy-tailed man, who you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley, which is where he was every day, roaming the dark labyrinth beneath the palace at Nassos, on the island of Crete in Greece. Or was he? Are there any real parts to his story? From Jim Henson and the Labyrinth, quote, Through dangers untold, and hardships unnumbered, I have fought my way here to the castle, beyond the goblin city, to take back the child you have stolen. For my will is as strong as yours, and my kingdom as great. You have no power over me. The Minotaur has been an easy target over time as a bad guy, capable of cannibalism, taken out of context and conveniently used as a symbol of a monster of some really horrendous human behavior, as in George Frederick Watts' 1885 painting of the Minotaur, oil on canvas at the Tate Museum in London, England, titled The Minotaur. He is standing maybe by an ocean wall, looking out over the ocean, awaiting his victims, which the artist tied to evil human behaviors. Can't we just have a good old-fashioned monster painting? Of course not. It's got to be twisted to something even worse. Be the light you want to see in the world, George. Be the light. There are more bullheaded, zoo anthropomorphic, human and animal combined in one, creatures than the Minotaur, so he's not entirely alone, unless we're talking about in the labyrinth. Some of these are in the deity realm rather than that of monsters. Takes one to know one, King Minos. Oh. But these others are not necessarily stubborn and bullheaded, but rather physically a bullhead on a human body or a bull body human head. For example, in Hinduism, Nandi is a bahana or mount for Shiva, might be shown as a bull or with a human body and a bull's head.
or from the Epic of Gilgamesh, wings, bull body, human head, is the protective Lamassu. Ancient Egypt absolutely had a deity in this form known as Apis, with the head of a bull and human body. And sorry for any mispronunciations. Oi, we're back to the story. We have the king on Crete, King Minos, who was a real treat. I shouldn't be so judgy, but let's see what you think after you hear the myth slash story. Long ago and far away, let's start out by finding out who Minos's parents were and how they met. Oh right, Zeus was his dad. Right. And his mother was Europa. Zeus in the shape of a bull. Oh dang, are bulls going to be a theme? Carried Europa off to Crete. So a long myth short, Minos was the son of a deity transformed into a bull and a woman. Fun fact, did you know that Minos in Cretan means king? So King Minos is like King King? Okay, what about Queen Pasiphae's parents? Helios, the sun god, and Perse, an Osinid nymph. Alrighty, clearly it's complicated. Let's continue. Okay, mythological genealogy aside, we've at last arrived at the origin story of the Minotaur. The story goes that the god Poseidon sent a really beautiful snow-white bull to King Minos to sacrifice. But the king decided that instead of sacrificing the bull, he would keep the bull. We all know you don't want to piss off a god. Hand slapped to the forehead. Oy. So, cause and effect. You know where this is going, right? And it gets cringy. So, Poseidon was understandably upset and did his godly thing, causing Queen Pasiphae of Crete, Minos' wife, to fall in love with the white bull that he had sent the king to sacrifice. Huh? I mean, he could have caused an earthquake, tsunami, struck King Minos down, but he chose that. You don't want to mess with this guy. Why did Pasiphae get thrown under the bus for Poseidon being displeased with Minos? Subsequently, Queen Pasiphae got pregnant and the hybrid Minotaur was born. It's a boy! Head and tail of a bull, body of a human. Remind you of King Minos' parents? Pretty close to home with god bull magic going on. Deep breath. Okay, now the story continues that the baby Minotaur was given the name of Asterion, Starry One, which I think is a very sweet name. Asterion was the only bull-headed human. He was a one-of-a-kind creature. So, uh, just because I have to do this, what was the smallest creature in Greek mythology? The Minotaur. Moving right along, so Minos had a problem. From one lecture I listened to, the Minotaur matured and was going around eating people. As you're all perfectly aware, cows and bulls don't eat meat, but they do eat things like oats and barley, and what is called roughages like grass. Bulls live for 10 to 12 years, but who knows what the sci-fi data would be for a human-bull hybrid length of life. King Minos of Crete took his problem to none other than the, yes, the very one we've talked about, the Oracle of Delphi, who was channeling Apollo. So for more about the Oracle, please listen to the three episodes of the Whispering Gallery, Vaporous Prophecy and Gossamer Magic, released in October 2022. As a quick thumbnail, the Oracle of Delphi was the mouthpiece of the god, Apollo, and was actually more than one woman. They were a resource. People would travel to them, present their questions, and the answers would not always be clear and may have to have been interpreted. The oracle, or team oracle, duly passed along Apollo's message to Minos. The message? That King Minos should create a labyrinth to hold the Minotaur. Turns out the king knew a guy, Daedalus, who built the labyrinth for him. Kind of a shady gig, but I'm sure it was paying the bills. This is just getting worse and worse, making it clearly a myth soap opera mashup. Say that ten times fast. So King Minos locks up Asterion in the underground labyrinth built in the basement of the palace. Side note about Minos. There's a story that he pursued a woman all over Crete until in desperation, 
She threw herself into the ocean, where she was saved by a fisherman's net. As we get to know more about him, King Minos sounds pretty intense across the board. Now Theseus, the son of Aegis, the king of Athens, and Aethra grew up. His father, Aegis, had put a large stone over sandals and a sword, that when Theseus was old enough and strong enough to move, he could find him. When he did so, moving the, the large stone, his mother told him it was time for him to go find his father. Theseus ended up in Athens, and this is its own story. In the end, his father, the king, recognized him. We were talking about the Minotaur eating sacrificial teenagers. That's where we're at in the story, which came as a tribute from Athens, paid to King Minos, who insisted King Aegis send seven boys and seven girls to the labyrinth to be eaten by the Minotaur every nine years. Theseus decided to volunteer as one of the doomed tributes to be sent to the Minotaur, and that he would kill the Minotaur. So again, with that timeline, every nine years, I mean, Maybe magical hybrid bull men live longer than bulls. Um, but every nine years, that, I mean, how old was the Minotaur when Theseus went to kill him? When Theseus arrived in Crete, Ariadne, the Minotaur's half-sister, King Minos' daughter, helped him by asking the architect of the labyrinth how to get back out of the labyrinth. And he told her that Theseus should use a string to unroll as he went and to follow it back out. So in he went, killed the Minotaur, and found his way back out. He and Ariadne left Crete together, but um, he abandoned her on the way home to Athens, because of course he did. There is one last zinger. Theseus had agreed to change his sail to send a message on his way to Athens. A white sail meant success, a black sail hoisted by the crew meant he had failed. Theseus didn't remember to change the sail, he sailed to Athens with a black sail. His father, King Aegis, grief-stricken, jumped from a cliff into the sea. We now have the Aegean Sea, and Theseus became king. So we have a tale of the cannibalistic hungry minotaur trapped in the labyrinth to keep him from randomly snacking on the neighbors. Quote, when Arthur Evans visited Nassos in March 1894, he was shown around the excavations by Calocorinos and wrote in his diary, I see no reason for not thinking that the mysterious complication of passages is the labyrinth. That was from ashmolean.org article slash myths of the labyrinth. He rebuilt a couple of areas and mapped out what was what. Kind of his best guess. I've read was kind of as good as anyone's. So, Sir Arthur Evans. This is from brown.edu. Quote, Sir Arthur John Evans, born July 8th, 1851, and died July 11, 1941, was a British archaeologist who was well known for his work on the Minoan Palace at Nassos on Crete. Evans was born in Nash Mills, England, and was educated at Oxford and the University of Göttingen. He was also curator of the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford from 1884 to 1908. So, Evans was drawn to the island of Crete, initially because of his interest in ancient coins and seal stones. He began his excavations at Nassos in 1899, when he took over the site, which was previously being excavated by Minos Calicarinos. He found evidence of an early Bronze Age civilization which predates the recently discovered Mycenaean settlements. He also found a large number of clay tablets written in new scripts, including Linear A and Linear B. Evans finished most of the excavations at Nassos by 1903. He continued research and the work on the surrounding areas until 1931. He also oversaw a great deal of the restoration at the Palace of Nassos, which is now considered by many to be excessive. Again, that came from brown.edu. Next up, this is a, a poem dated from January 1966, which a comment is made in form of poem titled To the Memory of Kazantakis. And to all of those who made the movie Zorba the Greek, the first stanza reads, Leave the Greeks alone, will you? Recommended a poet once to another poet who talked about the Greeks. But this poet, the one who talked about Greeks, did not think about them, or about Greece, neither did the other. Because one thought about white statues and their beauty and the freedom of loving them without vines, 
which even the gods compelled to wear these days, and the other hated in the way of talking about the Greeks, not the false exchange of gods for bodies, but what seemed to him a treason to our bitter life for the sake of escapism that perhaps was not there towards a past that is wrinkled, extinct, and shaven. In quoting from the torch.ox.ac.uk, they state, if one is to take the middle section of this letter at face value, Senna seems to have gotten it right, but perhaps the final stanza here requires further clarification. A few months later, in a poem dated October 1970, which Sophia titled The Minotaur, the final stanza reads, In Crete, where the Minotaur reigns, I went through the wave, eyes open fully awake, without drugs or a potion, just the wine I drank and the solemnity of things. For I belong to the race of those who go through the labyrinth, without ever losing the linen thread of the word. And I just thought that was a really beautiful, would that be called a stanza? The, without ever losing the linen thread of the word. That was from In Crete with the Minotaur, Greece in the poems and letters of Sophia de Mello Reiner Anderson and George de Senna, 1965 to 1977, from Torch, the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities, University of Oxford. In the next episode, we'll take a closer look at the Palace of Knossos and Sir Arthur Evans' observation that it was a labyrinth. Then we'll explore a small sampling of famous garden labyrinths and the garden design, like the hedge maze in The Shining, and the bamboo labyrinth in the Poison Garden at Alnwick. We'll be also discussing about Sir Arthur Evans and the freedom he took with naming and making assumptions about different rooms in the palace and different names of the rooms and his assumption about the labyrinth and what was behind that. And I will talk to you soon with part two of the Ghosts of Legendary Labyrinths. And remember to keep your flashlights close and your spooky art stories closer while visiting the Whispering Gallery.